Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. tax reform to the European Union's latest development. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services Leader. You can find me on Twitter at XBorderTax. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, I'm excited to have Sindhu Bloom. Sindhu is the host and executive producer of PwC's Policy on Demand. Policy on Demand is PwC's app-based web series providing insight and analysis on policy changes impacting companies. Sindhu had suggested that we turn the tables on the Cross-Border Tax Talks podcast where the interviewer becomes the interviewee. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sindhu. And I'll be honest, Sindhu, this is a little awkward for me sitting on this side of the table. For those that are listening on the podcast, you'll have to go and check out the YouTube version. But uh, I'll officially hand the reins over. Thank you. And Doug, you're going to be fine. Um, But welcome to your podcast. Thank you. And, you know, there are so many people who tune into this podcast, and they know your background, but I would like to give you the full Doug McConey treatment. All right. Okay. Let's hear it. So you are PwC's U.S. International Tax Services Leader and a principal in the firm's Washington National Tax Services Practice here in D.C., and before that, you were national co-leader of the U.S. Integrated Global Structuring Practice, and before that, the National ITS Leader for the Retail and Consumer Industry Sector. You're a member of the Advisory Board for the International Tax Journal, and you have your Bachelor in Accountancy and a JD from the University of Missouri, Columbia, Go Tigers. M-I-Z. Right, and from following you on YouTube and Instagram, I know that you're a huge Cardinals fan. Big time. And also a dog person. Yep, got very two of those. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a dog dad, very proud dog dad, absolutely. And for those stumbling onto this podcast for the first time, you have a leadership slash travel vlog on YouTube, which just wrapped up its third season. Congratulations. Thank you. 120 episodes That's all amazing. in. Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and you're heading into season four, and your vlog can be found under your name, Doug McConey, on YouTube. And this podcast, Cross Border Tax Talks, is housed on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play and in video format on your YouTube channel as a playlist. That's right. All right. So the topic of today's podcast is strategic approaches to planning in a dynamic environment, and which, which is permeating so many conversations these days because of the incredible amount of change happening in the world. And I actually thought that your vlog and your podcast were excellent analogies for this topic because at some point before season one of the vlog, you had to say, all right, I think this is going to be a great way to communicate with the world, and I want to find out why that is. Yeah, I, I, I spent a lot of time, particularly early in my career and before I came to Washington and before I got some leadership positions, really running teams. And my ability, um, the ability to communicate with people and particularly young people within our organization was really something that always inspired me. And I feel like kind of as I moved up within the organization and frankly spending more time with clients and some of the leadership responsibilities, I became a little bit disconnected with with some of the younger people. And I really thought that YouTube and I've been a big YouTube fan since the early days. And I just thought that was amazing how people could communicate with a broad audience. And so when I started on the channel, I tried to make it not necessarily particularly focused on international tax, but more about careers and leadership and team building and things that I've learned throughout the course of my 20 year career that I could share with people. And I felt like YouTube was just a unique and novel way to be able to do it. Similarly with the podcast, you know, I'm a wonky tax nerd at heart, as you well know, Sindhu, from the, my many appearances on Policy on Demand. Not enough, though. Not, and I, I, I'm looking forward to my next, uh, my next visit there. But the, the podcast really seemed, and I love podcasts, like a, a, a really interesting way to be able to connect with people and share some of these various technical issues. And, you know, I always enjoyed the podcasts that were more conversational, where people were just talking about topics that they were very familiar with. So I've really tried the, the podcast to structure it similarly. And, and in fact, what I tell people when they come on is like, I don't want you to do any preparation. What we're going to be talking about, you're already an expert in. And I'll be honest, sitting on this side of the table, I'm a little nervous with that <laughs> format, but uh, we're going to live with it. No, it's going to be great. And I think the video also adds a level of intimacy that I think in, in, our prof- in this profession, which is lacking. I mean, you you want to be able to talk to people. I mean, when you go on trips on and, and to you're having pretty heavy discussions, but you make it fun, and I think that's that's really important. Well, thank you. It's it's, it's been a fun uh, fun journey. 
And so season four will be coming soon, as you mentioned. Now, when is the start date for season four? I don't have an official launch okay. date. I'm not going to commit to a launch date yet, but there are some big changes coming. So you'll have to, to come back and, and check it out. I can't wait. All right. All right. So let's get started. Um, I would love to start off by talking about company approaches to tax reform. What kind of conversations are you having? And what are some of the challenges that people, companies are having when dealing with tax reform, which frankly, I think, you know, just left an enormous amount of work for people to work through. Yeah, so I spend a lot of time in since, you know, taking over the U.S. International Tax Services leader position about, I guess, 13, 14 months ago, a little over a year ago, talking to a lot of VPs of tax, tax directors, even CFOs. And the amount of work that was created as a result of the TCJA, I just think other than people within the tax community don't appreciate just the amount and level of work that's taken because you know, it was kind of pitched publicly as a simplification. And if I think anybody who's listened to these 30 plus episodes of the podcast knows that that, and any of the policy on demand knows that that is just not the truth. And so companies just trying to comply with the rules, just trying to come up with their quarterly provisions, just trying to do the tax returns has been a just a really, really gargantuan effort. And I think that, you know, trying to develop the in-house expertise on some of these provisions, and particularly we don't even know what some of the rules are, right? Tech companies are doing tax returns, and we do not have final regulations. There are a bunch of complications. We talked with Pam Olson on the last episode of Cross Border Tax Talks with respect to technical corrections. There's so much uncertainty that just to try to do a provision and to do a compliance is, is really difficult. And, you know, trying to identify what tools and resources to be able to do that, I think, is fundamentally different under the TCJA than what it was pre-TCJA. So companies are saying, well, should I outsource certain components? What tools should we use? One of the things that I've been particularly focused on is trying to get out of a spreadsheet environment and more into a centralized rules engine. I mean, these rules are so complicated and so intertwined and overlapping that the historic spreadsheet environment makes it really difficult to be able to to do a lot of these computations, particularly where companies have a whole variety of different issues between BEAT and 163J and FDII and GUILTY. I mean, it's just really complicated. And what that means is, is that what companies are doing and the people that, that are VPs of tax and tax directors are, are, are fundamentally having to change kind of the way they operate it. I think that historically, many people would have just in-house done their own foreign tax credit computations, which I think we'll come to, and have done some of these, had done the basic math themselves. Well, now, first of all, the math is so much more complicated, and plus there's still so much uncertainty that talking to to companies and, and asking them, like, what is the best and highest use of the people that you have on your team? Does it really make sense for that person to continue to, to really be focused on a spreadsheet or should he or she maybe step back more focused on data, for example, right. and getting good data and then looking to outsource those types of compliance and provision activities that maybe were done internally how, how does that tax department fundamentally need to change to take advantage or to, to deal with these, with these changes in the tax rules? And it's, it's such a massive change, just both the technical rules, but then how companies operate. Uh, I'm not sure that even almost two years in, we're, we're still getting adjusted and trying to figure out how to make it all work. You know, sometimes um, when I'm interviewing folks, I get the sense that there are companies kind of struggling with these questions. And it's almost as if they're hitting the pause button and saying, all right, let me just get a sense of what's happening in this landscape. Would you would you agree with that? Or is that is that the sense that you get? Yeah, there's like a lot. There's, I think, an instinct whenever we're in an environment with a lot of change for people just to say to want to hit the pause button and to create this kind of stagnation and just say, well, we want the dust to settle and then we'll decide what we want to do. And the problem is, is that the. I'm mixing metaphors here, but the the ground continues to move while you're waiting for things to settle down. And, you know, as we think about some of the non-U.S. stuff, even, I mean, just the the changes within tax reform and waiting for regulations and everything is one thing, but then all the stuff that's taking place internationally between ATAD and now we've got BEPS 2.0, that I think just waiting around for the dust to settle or the ground to stop moving is just, it, it's not going to happen. And so, you know, it's hard shooting at a goal when the goalposts are moving, but that's effectively what we're doing. Right. And, but how do you, how do you work through that? How do you work through that stagnation? Well, I mean, you have to be able to, to, to convince 
um, the the stakeholders and whether you're a VP of tax or a, a, a tax director, first of all, I think that you know more resources. I mean, is something that I, I hear commonly, and of course, we say that within PwC. I hear that within the other service providers, but then also with industry. And then you know, of course, every business is focused on costs, and and so trying to communicate. To, and I've had a number of conversations with CFOs too, where you know, tax directors and VPs of tax, are like, can you share sort of the story of like how much more complicated this is. Like as I, as I think about our business within PwC, what changes have we made structurally to our business to deal with that? Well, some of those things that we've learned, you know, I've shared with CFO, it's just like, listen, you need a lot more resources to deal with just the general compliance because stuff is so much more complicated than it was. And so I think educating those stakeholders to be able to find those additional resources and whether it's, it sounds self-serving, whether it's hiring us or whether it's you know hiring more people internally right. or looking for additional resources within a company that you know we just need more to do the work. And not surprisingly, that's not always the case. And so that will help, I think, kind of get the ball moving to the extent that you can get more resources. I feel like that's probably gonna be a theme across the board as well is getting out of the stagnation but talk about some trends that you've seen um as you're as you're communicating with with companies post tax reform yeah so the we've talked about some of these things on the podcast over the course of time but there's definitely a number of common themes that we're seeing that companies are focused on and issues that that are have it that they're having one of the biggest ones and again something we've spoken a lot about is guilty is the global intangible um low tax income rules and the separate foreign tax credit basket that was created as a part of this new guilty regime and the fact that to the extent that your blended rate and your CFCs is at or above 13.125 and you know, we'll talk about expense apportion, but there are just so many companies that are out there that have excess credits in the guilty basket. And those excess credits do not carry over. They're just, I call it the casket basket. That's where the credits go to die. <laughs> it's my little, I, yeah. I don't know who came up with that. I'm not sure I did, but I, I like it and I, and I use it a lot. And so companies, uh, and particularly in, in a number of industries, historically never had to worry about foreign tax credit carry forwards. You know, when we were at a 35% environment and we really only had two baskets, which was the general basket and the passive basket, most companies or a lot of companies, I should say, didn't spend too much time focusing on the foreign tax credits because they had more than enough to, to deal with and it was only in the general basket. I mean, frankly, growing up in, in the Midwest and in the Rust Belt, those were the companies that had more foreign tax credit issues than I think than others in, in, in other industries. But if you look at even tech and pharma and some of these other industries where it wasn't a big issue, well, now they're having to deal with foreign tax credits. And so I've spent a bunch of time educating people in these other industries, how does the foreign tax credit limitation work? Explaining about stewardship and R&D and interest expense apportionment and companies that really just haven't spent a whole lot of time in that just kind of blocking and tackling compliance type of work, really focusing on that because that is something like, listen, to the extent that you've got uh, expenses that are moving against the guilty basket, those credits, you know, that's a 20, 21 cents on the dollar loss. Or you, you end up losing that deduction. So it's I, I think the common theme really across industries is really focusing on just, again, it's some of the blocking and tackling, getting the compliance right, thinking about expense apportionment and, and managing the that, that foreign tax credit in the guilty right. basket. And it's just across the board. And even inbound companies with CFCs underneath the US, I mean, anybody who's got CFCs underneath the US is having to deal with these issues. Okay, and but when you think about trends, um, and I'm going to ask you if you have a crystal ball, like how, how, you know what they are right now, but how are you kind of anticipating what's what's coming in the future and how you're talking to companies about dealing with their current issues and, all right, this possibly may happen? Yeah, the way I describe it is we are right now we're, we're, we're kind of getting washed over. I, I describe it as, as maybe waves and then with a potential tsunami right behind it. So I think that the first wave that we're all just drenched in is U.S. reform, dealing with these guilty FTCs, just dealing with compliance. I mean, just F, how do you document FDII? All these U.S. companies, particularly in, in beside the U.S.-based companies that are dealing with BEAT, which nobody thought that the base erosion anti-abuse tax was supposed to even apply to U.S. MNCs, and obviously for the foreign parented companies that are having to imp, that are impacted by that, we're all awash in that. 
Well, right behind that is the anti-tax avoidance directive. And, and this goes that we don't even are going to talk about Brexit, right? I'm just talking about pure tax stuff. <laughs> right, right. Right. And there's all this other geopolitical issues. But just from, just from a pure tax perspective, what's right behind that is ATAD. And that's really BEPS, what's now I think being referred to as BEPS 1.0. And all these anti-hybrid rules, which every member of the EU has to – an act by January 1st amongst a series of other rules, January 1st, 2020. And I, I think so many of us are awash in U.S. tax reform. It's just like, hey, there's another wave coming. Oh, and by the way now, for those that have been paying attention to what's been happening with the French digital service tax, and spoiler alert, this is not just going to impact companies that are in the tech and the digital space. But as we start thinking about BEPS 2.0, where you know this is the tsunami behind those yep. those those waves and the way i think about it is like that tsunami is the theoretical global formulary apportionment um which i i can't believe that we'll ever get there but i'll be honest i can't believe we're as far as we are today with after you know beps 1.0 and so you know trying to plan for all of this first of all just comply let alone to to try to plan and you know, our clients are getting lots of pressure from the street. What's their effective rate? And trying to create certainty and to tell their CFOs when there's just all these waves coming in is just is really challenging. Well, and then you do, but you do have the interplay of Brexit you, and DSTs and trade. I mean, everything that's going on with trade, the planning just becomes that much more complicated. Right, because you know, we, and you, you hear this a lot in the media, even in the, the non-tax media, too. Companies like certainty, right? right. Everybody wants certainty. Well, first of all, with all the tax changes we, we've just described, there's no certainty. But then when we think about all the geopolitical issues, you know, there's not certainty there either. And obviously, companies' supply chains, where they're acquiring their products or their, their raws or whatever, plays a really big impact into how much tax they're paying. And I think, you know, one of the other common themes that we're seeing is, is that, you know, companies with U.S. Ta U.S. companies and with the new U.S. tax system are still incentivized to reduce foreign taxes, right? The way our guilty regime works, you get 80 percent of the credits. And so even if you can take all of your credits in guilty, you're still incentivized because you only get a credit for 80 percent to try to reduce those foreign taxes. Well, with all with Brexit and, you know, all the trade discussions going on with China as companies are looking at supply chains. It's, it's hard for certainty and then to try to, to try to be proactive as far as how you manage the affairs, by definition, people are just having to be reactive. And it makes it, makes it very difficult to try to manage that for those foreign taxes when you, the business people are just simply being reactive to the instability that's taking place across the globe. Last week, I did an interview on Brexit and interviewed somebody in the UK as well as our UK tax lead in New York, Gareth Hughes. And my question was, well, what are companies saying? And they both said, you know, there is a lot of, there's Brexit fatigue. Yeah. And, and I imagine it's not just Brexit, it's the trade, it's the digital, it's post-U.S. tax reform. And that, that fatigue is not going to end, and you've just got to keep going. Yeah, and I've heard the, the fatigue point, like, because I made the comment about just get more resources. You know, what am I telling clients? It's just like, well, the CFO is like the VPs and the tax directors. I'm like, listen, this is my, I've been telling the CFO this, you know, they've got fatigue of like, Hey, just figure it out. Everybody right. else is right. like, you know, I know there's a lot of changes, but you know, you've been saying this for, you know, however many, you know, two years since reform was right on the horizon. And, and with reform, I think there's also the uncertainty of, all right, it, after it was enacted, all right, it's two more years until the next presidential election. That also plays in. So what's going to happen with that? You know, will anything happen with walking anything back? We have no idea. No idea. All right. So the other thing that I'm very curious about, and I ask everybody about this, is how, when your conversations with companies, how are you keeping them calm? Yeah, what is your style? <laughs> well, um, that's, I, I, I've sometimes been accused of marketing fear. You know, and that is obviously the last thing that we're trying to do, particularly as advisors. But, you know, you start talking about everything that we've just talked about with Guilty and then, I mean, DAC 6. And I mean, there's just so many different things that companies need to be focused on and, and, and worried on or worried about. And, you know, it, it's just it's such a challenging in, environment that, you know, I, I think that what, what we try to do and what I try to do even with my with our partners in the practice is just try to educate as much as you can. Right. Try to get knowledge out there. Try to make sure that you've got the appropriate expertise. And so even for those um, people within industry, like 
you know, coming up with new ways and novel approaches to dividing and conquering. I mean, we do that even within our practices where it's just like, okay, we'll make somebody responsible for following right. these certain areas and then communicating to others. But I think it's really important for companies to be strategic with respect to how they deal with this, we call it knowledge management, because it's, there is just so much. And particularly for some of the smaller companies and the smaller groups that maybe don't have very big tax departments, I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming. Yeah. And this is what I tell people this, and I acknowledge, like, it's overwhelming for me. Like, and, and this is my job. I'm the ITS leader for PwC, and it's just like, it is hard to keep up. And, uh, and so I think, you know, having some empathy first is, is always a, a good approach because yeah, it is a little scary. There's certainly some fear, but you know, you, you just got to try to manage it and use whatever resources you have to, to deal with it because these are scary times. They are. Um, but as, as a, a practice leader here, as you move forward and you're looking at all these challenges and all these complications and the chaos and the noise, what are your priorities? Well, um, I, I think that, you know, generally speaking and kind of putting myself in the client's shoes and as far as what their priorities are, I mean, getting the, the compliance and the provision right is really, really important, right? And so, you know, whenever obviously you're filing tax returns and whenever you're, you know, issuing public financial statements, that's really, you start with the blocking and tackling, right? right? I mean, there's just so much going on, but really starting with the blocking and tackling, I think is, is, is really important. And then, you know, when you start thinking about more proactively and not surprisingly, when I talk to CFOs, it's just like, hey, the tax rate went down from 35 to 21 percent. But what's very interesting to me is that I think that generally speaking, the street is still looking for companies to reduce their rates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they understandably look at their competitors, you know, look at a company's competitors and said, OK, well, somebody's rate went down from 31 to 24 right but then they look at their competitor was like well that your competitor has it a 22 so why aren't you at a 22 right. <laughs> and so that that just hasn't stopped and so you know companies trying to still need to be proactive but it's just like first of all everybody needs to make sure that they get the compliance right get the provisioning right and then really starting to think about more proactively how do you manage the new systems both in the US and Europe to try to minimize that that overall effective rate is is really the next step so, Doug, the other thing I'm curious about, you've, you know, you've been in D.C. for a while now, and what has it been like engaging with regulators, and also how are companies engaging with regulators? Well, yeah, I, I, for my first 19 years of my career, I was always able to make the point like, well, you know, I'm outside the beltway. And, uh, you know, 20 years in, all of a sudden, here I am. So it, it has been, first of all, just a very, you know, educational experience for me. I obviously went to law school and understand the process, but you know, having resources and, and people, you know, like Pam Olson, who's mm -hmm. been on the vlog a number of times, Mike DeFranzo really shed some light on how the inner workings of the IRS work. That's been fascinating for me. And um, frankly, I've, I personally spend less time with that and leave that to the Pat Browns and the Pam Olsons and, and some of those. But one of the things that I think has really been educational for me and one of the things that I've learned a lot and what I'm now encouraging our clients to do as well is you know, engaging with regulators. And, and first of all, this is much more common in the U.S. Than, than, we're, than we see overseas, and maybe we can come back to that. But I think one of the things that I've really learned is that the, the government, whether it's, you know, whether joint committee, um, we had Kevin Livingston on, we had a, a podcast on the joint committee, whether it's, you know, the House Ways and Means, whether it's Treasury, that people want to hear from taxpayers. They, most importantly, though, I think they'll also deal with the practitioners, but they right. really want to hear from taxpayers. And I really feel like that I, I have, back to the empathy point, I have more empathy, particularly for Treasury. It's just like, holy cow, they have a Herculean effort to try to figure out how to write regs on a, you know, this tax law that was written relatively quickly. And it's been it's been interesting to me to see that, you know, government and particularly on panels and what we've seen publicly, they want taxpayers to engage in the discussion because it, they can't see all of the various issues and all of the things that have kind of popped up as we're trying to, to learn about U.S. tax reform and understand how it applies to our clients or to our respective companies. And so that's been fascinating for me, just how that process works. And like, listen, we, we all need to educate each other in the industry, whether we're in government, whether we're lawyers and accountants or 
you know, whether we're an industry, that there's this educational component and, you know, everybody one needs to try to understand. And, you know, certainly people are on kind of on different sides, right? But there is this really open dialogue that I have found very encouraging. Well, and it very much is we've all got to come to the table and not kind of burst in and say, I'm unhappy with this. You did a terrible job. It really is a discussion at the table. Right. And, and then with respect to the non-U.S. changes, I think, you know, that is, is also very challenging. And in particular, that in the foreign and outside the U.S., this concept of lobbying is, is a bad word, right? And I, I like to think that the discussion that we just had about trying to educate Treasury and those on the Hill with some of these issues is more about an education process than necessarily advocating for a particular position, although, of course, the taxpayer is going to be advocating for a particular position. But we just don't see it. It's just not as common outside the U.S., and oftentimes it's frowned upon. But I, I think it is important even outside the U.S. to, to educate the, the various stakeholders, and you know, depending what country it is, and particularly even with the OECD, because a lot of the policy is set above even where the governments are. Right. But that you know, there's much more dialogue, I think, even outside the U.S. And, and what I'm encouraging our, our clients and companies to do is get involved in the discussion. Like, don't be afraid to, because I think historically maybe there was this fear, whether it's in the U.S. or outside the U.S., is like, you know, you don't want to stick your head out of the out of the ground, you know, at the fear of getting shot. But I think that given the uncertainty across the globe, that engaging is 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 really important and something that I'm trying to encourage companies to do, again, both inside the U.S. and out. Okay. Since tax reform, one of the words I've heard over and over again is modeling. Yeah. It's become an essential part of whatever a company is planning to do, um, whatever its goals are. Tell me about your earlier exper experience in your career, what role that played and the role that it's playing now. Yeah, I feel like under the old regime, and maybe it was also because it was around for so long, although I'm not really convinced of the case, that things were a lot more, you could use intuition a lot more. In other right. words, like we only had the two foreign tax credit baskets, as I mentioned, and I think that many planners and advisors, as well as those in industry, kind of knew, well, here's what we need to do. And that you know you understood what the downstream consequences were of a particular decision of a particular decision or a particular business strategy that the company was doing. Well, now given the interaction, as I had mentioned before, between the various pr provisions between FDII and 163J and Guilty and Beat and you know even the old foreign tax credit baskets, that trying to use intuition just doesn't work. Like you have to model it out. That's just what we constantly say in meetings and as we're talking with, with taxpayers is like, you have to model it out because some of these things that I think would be just like, hey, you know, you, you're structuring this deal. This is the way you should do it. This would have made the most sense, you know, historically, or right. this is my understanding even under the new rules, how you should do it. And then you model it out and you're like, oh, I didn't realize, you know, some other, it's whackable is the, as the analogy that we give. And so, you know, having a, a, a really good comprehensive model to be able to, to understand what those downstream consequences are, it's just like you can't use intuition anymore. You really need to, to model everything out. And the amount of levers that we have or dials or whatever analogy are just way more than what were in the past. And so, and you gotta like to tweak a whole bunch of them to be able to, to get things to work. And what do you see happening when modeling occurs is there kind of a light bulb that goes off or are there drastic changes? What ha I mean, what, what, in your experience, what have you seen? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of light bulb moments. I think that, you know, boy, we're, I, mean, we're, I can't believe we're almost two years into it and we're still having these light bulb moments. I mean, I'm still, you know, when you run models and you just run and, and you run these different scenarios, um, we're still having these, these light bulb moments as issues come up and novel things uh, 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 appear. And so we're, I mean, I think that everybody's getting much more comfortable with the rules. Now I say that we're gonna get a whole pile of new regulations that we'll go through on future cross-border <laughs> right, tax talks. Right. We'll see how much that shakes it up. Um, but, you know, I think just, you know, trying to understand just what the landscape is, where those goalposts are heading is, it's just, it's challenging. Okay, a lot of complications coming our way. A lot, lot of more complications yes. coming our way, but modeling, modeling, modeling. <laughs> Doug, it has been an honor to sit in your seat. Well, thank you, Sindhu. The pleasure has been mine. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Sindhu Bloom, host and executive producer of PwC's Policy on Demand. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's international tax services leader. 
Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of Cross Border Tax Talks.